Hello and welcome to Home Worship. This week we're continuing our readings in the book of Acts. But let's begin with prayer. Heavenly Father, we call on your name and we lift you up in our worship time. Because you are the God who sustains us and cares for us. You rescue us from the places of darkness and you lead us in the ways of light. Please pour out your Holy Spirit on your church. Strengthen our confidence in you. Guide our feet as we walk in your ways and bring us to rest in your goodness and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Our Bible reading is from Acts chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. In those days, when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained about the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word of God in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and the ministry of the word. This proposal pleased the whole group. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Also Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. They presented these men to the apostles, who prayed and laid hands on them. So the word of God spread. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. Opposition arose, however, from members of the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, Jews of Cyrene and Alexandria, as well as the provinces of Sicilia and Asia, who began to argue with Stephen. But they could not stand up against the wisdom the Spirit gave him as he spoke. Then they secretly persuaded some men to say, We have heard Stephen speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. So they stirred up the people and the elders and the teachers of the law. They seized Stephen and brought him before the Sanhedrin. They produced false witnesses who testified, This fellow never stops speaking against this holy place and against the law, for we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs Moses handed down to us. All who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen, and they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. My friends, God has plans for you. He has things for you to do and wonderful things for you to be a part of. He's given you skills and he's given you a community. You have roles that only you can fill. You have something unique and important that only you can contribute. And all of this is a part of what it means to be the kingdom of God. We were made to be loved and to love. We were made to serve and to be served. And as we do this, we find the place where we belong. God also has unique surprises for you, adventures, experiences, and challenges that will come completely out of nowhere. These, I'm talking about things that are not part of your ordinary plan for your life. These are wonderful experiences that will just come upon you as you turn around the corner and there will be the surprise that God has in store for you. Some of these things will blow your mind. They will change your perspectives and they will test you to your very limits. So God has blessings for us in the ordinary plans that he has for our life and then these surprising extraordinary plans. In our Bible reading, we see that God provides the church with different people with different perspectives and different unique skills. In addition to the apostles, there are other leaders who are called to serve in the church. And they have important roles that are just as important as any other role. But then we also see God using these people in extraordinary ways that no one could ever have imagined. When the church set aside the seven servants they did in this Bible reading, they never imagined that God would use these men in the way that he does, to speak as a sign to the religious leaders, as an inspiration for the church for thousands of years to come. As our reading begins, we hear that the church has continued to grow, and more and more people are becoming disciples of Jesus. As this happens, more and more people bring more and more problems. It seems there's a division that's been formed between the Greek-speaking Christians 
and the Hebrew-speaking Christians. So these are people who come not only with a different language, but also a different cultural background. And they're all equal in the church, but we know that these different perspectives and different cultural backgrounds can sometimes cause confusion and sometimes difficulty. So the 12 apostles gathered the people around to decide what they were going to do. At this point, remember, Judas has been replaced by Matthias. And so we have 12 apostles who will be the 12 fathers of the church who will replace the 12 tribes of Israel. But the apostles can't do everything. They can't fill every role. They can't do everything the church needs to be done. So we see that even though there's 12 of them, that's a good number. And the church is not so great in number yet, but there's too much to be done. Not everything relies on these 12 men to do it all. The apostles can't do everything. They have their hands full teaching the word of God. They don't want to neglect that in order to serve people food. But this new problem is important. The people need to be cared for. And so the church needs more leaders. They need different people to step up and help out. This is an important lesson, not just for the early church, but for the church throughout all of time. There is no one person who can do everything. God has given each of us different gifts and abilities and a different cultural background, different perspectives, different ideas, so that we can all share together in the community and care for each other. In verses 5 and 6, we hear that the church presented seven men to the apostles for this particular task. And the apostles prayed for them and laid hands on them. This laying on of hands is an ancient Jewish custom that goes right back to the Old Testament. And it was a way to set apart people for a special purpose. We also see this practice continued right throughout the New Testament, where the laying on of hands is used to bless people, to commission them, to impart spiritual gifts on them. And today, the church continues this same practice. We lay hands on people for a special purpose or at a special time in their life. And here at the Ark, we love to lay hands on people at these special moments or at milestones in their life. These seven leaders were chosen to be put in charge of food distribution. But no doubt their role increased as more and more duties were added on to their role and they picked up different bits and pieces. They no doubt found all sorts of jobs that needed to be done that nobody was doing. This is just how it works. Notice that the church took their role very seriously and they appointed people who were filled with wisdom and filled with the Holy Spirit. They wanted people who would be wise and have good character, but they also wanted people who had a good relationship with God. Interestingly, all seven of these people have Greek names. Perhaps they've been put in this particular position to combat this unique problem that they were facing, to help with this division between the Greek-speaking Christians and the Jewish, the Hebrew-speaking Christians. So perhaps it was inspired to help bring some new perspective to the church leadership. As we read in the following chapters in the book of Acts, we see how the church adapted, how this rapidly changing environment that they were in posed new challenges, and each time the church simply responded. With the power of the Holy Spirit and the inspiration of God and the teaching of Jesus, they just continued to face whatever came to them. They didn't have a specific authority structure or a strategic plan, but they devoted themselves to God and to their love for each other. They went about the task of making disciples of all nations. See, the Christian faith is not a faith only for Jews. It's for all the nations. It's a truly inclusive and transformative message. And so, of course, the church community will be inclusive and transformative as they relate to this message. In verses 7 and 8, though, things get really interesting. So the apostles and the church have just set aside seven people for a particular purpose, and they're going about their work. But interestingly, God takes their idea and he turns the brightness up to a thousand. He used these seven people for his own purposes, purposes that nobody ever would have imagined that they could fill. 
God had plans that no one in the church planned for. Our God is a God of glory and wonder. And so, of course, he would take our gifts and use them for even more glorious purposes. Two of the seven are mentioned later on in the book of Acts, specifically Stephen and Philip. They're both mentioned, and it says that both of them performed great signs and wonders. In chapter 8, we read how God used Philip to share the good news in the city of Samaria and with the Ethiopian eunuch along the road. In chapter 7, we read how Stephen was martyred and not before he gave an amazing testimony before the religious leaders in the Sanhedrin. See, some of the members of the local synagogue got upset with Stephen and began to argue with him and stirred up trouble so that he was arrested and brought before the Sanhedrin. Now, being a Greek-speaking Christian, this would have been incredibly intimidating for him. He hadn't grown up in a traditional Jewish household. He hadn't had all the formal rabbinic training that these scholars had had. And he, hadn't, he wasn't in a position of authority like all of them were. And yet, no one was able to argue with him. He was able to stand up with the wisdom that the Holy Spirit gave to him. Again, we see the Holy Spirit working in the church. Friends, everything we do is in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us not forget where our strength comes from. He is our rock. He is our light. He is our inspiration. He is our help in times of trouble. And that's what we see here with Stephen. He didn't do this in his own wisdom, in his own strength. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. In the following chapter, we read Stephen's speech in chapter 7. It's incredible. It's nuanced and it's bold. Stephen is not afraid to challenge these religious leaders and call them away from their rejection of Jesus and call them back into the true faith. For this, they will sentence him to death by stoning and he will become the first martyr in the Christian church. So we see that sometimes doing the right thing doesn't always get the great results that we would like it to. Sometimes when we serve the Lord, there is no earthly glory or wonderful outcome that we can enjoy. For Stephen, the result will be that they literally drag him out of the city and stone him to death. It's a horrible way to die. And yet, somehow in that moment, Stephen shows incredible nobility and strength and dignity. God sustained him as he gave up his spirit. And he even spoke a prayer of forgiveness over the people who were murdering him. So Stephen stands in a long line of servants who did what God asked, regardless of what the results might be. The prophets in the Old Testament were constantly speaking to a people who refused to listen to them. And then Moses led a people in the wanderings in the wilderness. He led a people who refused to be faithful to God again and again, turning away from him and doing the wrong thing. Today, the church continues to serve in a world that doesn't recognize Jesus. We serve in a culture that would constantly lead us away from everything that God wants for us. We show unfailing, unselfish love because that's what Jesus has shown to us. Not because we want to achieve anything or we're looking for any results. The benefit that we receive is that we are children of God. And the results that we work for is only to please our loving Heavenly Father. And only because He has already loved us first. Finally, at the end of the chapter, we see that God was with Stephen. Even as he's standing before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish ruling council, facing all of these false accusations that they were brought against him, he sat, sat there and said nothing. He didn't need to defend himself because God was there defending him. His face shone like that of an angel. The glory of heaven was upon him. Stephen brought a bold appeal to the highest Jewish authorities. He called them to repent of their unbelief and turn back to God. And what we see is that the Holy Spirit was the one who was working through him all along. He was chosen because he was full of the Holy Spirit. They recognized that this was really important. 
and no one could stand up against him because of the wisdom that the Holy Spirit gave to him. Friends, I want you to know that you too are anointed with the Spirit. You have been set apart for God's purposes. Maybe you have been set apart not for a ministry in the church like Stephen was, but in all of our work, in all of our callings, everything we do is the work of God's. All of our work is holy because we are holy people and everything we do is for the kingdom of God. The church has this truly optimistic approach to community. We believe that God our Father has given every single person special gifts and he calls every one of us to holy work. We're called to be friends and neighbours. We're called to be mothers and fathers, spiritual mothers and spiritual fathers. And these everyday roles in everything that we do, they are actually a holy calling. There is so much joy in serving and loving the people around us, using the gifts that we have to serve our community. And there is a gift and a blessing in these little everyday moments of life. But then God also has wonderful plans that are outside of all of this. We have our normal blessings from the roles that we have in everyday life, but in addition to that, you will discover new wonderful things that God has in store for you. Adventures, experiences, and challenges that will grow you more and more. And you will discover more and more of God's grace. And as you discover that more and more, you will discover freedom, a freedom to be the person that you are not what people expect you to be, not even what you expect yourself to be, but simply who you are, the person that God has made you to be. As you discover these wonderful things, as you face the challenges of life, you are never alone. God is always with you. His Holy Spirit has been poured into your heart. God's love covers over you every moment of your life like a blanket of protection. And God's grace and presence brings you a peace that the world cannot give. God is with you everywhere you go. Psalm 139 says that there is nowhere you can go to escape from his spirit. And Jesus promises that he would be with us always, even to the end of the age. The spirit of God is upon you. And he is empowering you to do the work that you do every day. He will guide you by his light and he will fill you with his grace and love. The the glory of God shines on you just like it shone on Stephen that day in the Sanhedrin. No one can oppose the God who lives in you and with you. His love does not depend on any of your achievements. If it did, it wouldn't be grace. But instead, he fills you with everything you need from day to day. He guides you and helps you to discover the person that he made you to be. At this point in the service, you might like to give your offering to God. Our bank account details are on the screen if you would like to give electronically. Now let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, your love welcomes us and your goodness sustains us. You bring abundant life to your people and you set us free from all our sin. Bless your church as we celebrate the good news. We pray for those countries around the world that are ravaged by poverty and disease. By your power, make your church strong to confront injustice and to show generosity and kindness to the world. You came as Messiah to save your people. Bless your church and your pastors as they proclaim the forgiveness of sins. May we call on your name in all circumstances and trust in your grace at all times. May we be witnesses of your good news and show forgiveness to those around us. This week, we think of our confirmation class who are confirming their faith at the Ark this weekend. Would you fill each of these young people with peace and confidence as they stand and confess their faith publicly? Equip them for the challenges ahead and fill their hearts with your joy as they receive the blessings that you are giving them. We thank you for your disciples of every generation, those who have gone before us and those who stand beside us. As we journey together, may we be encouraged by them and walk with them as we make our way home to you. All of these things we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 
I'll hand over to you now to finish this time of worship in your own time and in your own way. You might like to spend some time journaling or highlighting or making some notes in the margin of your Bible. You might also like to sing along to some worship songs and praise the name of the Lord. And then when you're ready, you can close with the Lord's Prayer. Peace.